Welcome to Adastra. Uh, we're going to pick things up with part 8 just where we left it last time with our mysterious figure who is probably the Romanus. <clears throat> I just need a little time. Understand that this will not be easy even for the parents. The pain will be temporary. What's happening? You will know in time, but not yet. Time loses meaning. Blackness. Simultaneously eternal and non-existent. Nightmares ebb and flow, building and fading. Scenes from my earliest childhood to my landing on Adastra, all warped by horrific and violent imagery that never happened. But as soon as each one ends, I forget. Just like any other dream, except one. I'm huddled in the seat of this ship, freezing cold, numb with desperation and the fear of impending death. How is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? I glance back at the crumpled form of the wolf in the back of the ship. His head is framed by a pool of blood, the metal pipe just a few feet away where I dropped it. I've made a huge mistake. The anger and terror I'd been feeling over the past several hours, days, weeks, builds until I scream and smash both my fists onto the glowing panels in front of me. The next thing I know, light blasts the interior of the ship and I cover my face with my hands. Still the light pierces through and I see blood red. The ship vibrates violently and I know right away we're being pulled into it. I reach out despite the impossible light, uselessly pounding at the unresponsive panels. After a few moments, the brightness and heat become unbearable and I finally throw myself to the floor, crawling away, crawling toward my wolf. Amicus, help! But the light continues to grow, and soon everything is lit up in a blinding white, the heat so intense that the metal melts underneath my hands and knees. I'm on fire. I am fire. I feel lines of molten lead course through from the base of my neck, down my spine branching out into my limbs, even my toes and fingers. I can only float in the inferno, dumbly wondering why I still feel if I'm dead, wondering if this is death as the ship, the wolf and I become part of the star. Once again, time is lost and I only exist as fire. I stare up at the sky. The air is suddenly cool as I try to comprehend the sudden change in the harsh all-consuming starlight the gentle cold moonlight. Still fire continues to lance through my head, neck, spine and limbs in agonising lines, my body mapped as a tortured stick figure. It hurts, hurts more than anything I've ever experienced, for it's fading after what happened in the star, so I try to relax in the sand. After a few minutes I realise I can hear the waves and I feel something drawing me toward the water. I'm a little scared of getting in, of any movement at all, terrified they might trigger the pain in you. But it doesn't. It almost feels like I'm not moving at all. I glide toward the water, watching the surface reflect the bright planet and moon in hypnotic ripples. Entering the lake and feeling the cold, gentle water wash over my skin is the best feeling I've ever felt. It envelops me slowly, moving up my legs, torso and finally my head. And just like that, the pain and fire is chased away, subdued to a dull, tingly throb. I gasp in relief, somehow able to breathe into the water. I drift through the dark water, watching the globes of light dance and sway above me before I finally resurface. It's only then that I remember Amicus. Fear grips me. Was he still on that ship? Did I leave him behind in the star? 
I look up and see the lights glittering from the palace and I begin to swim towards it, somehow moving much faster than I should be able to. Instead of swimming to the beach though, I end up moving toward the balcony, straight to Amicus's room. As I get closer, I realise that someone is on the balcony. It's Amicus and my heart fills with relief. He's got his back to the railing, leaning against it casually. Even though I can only see him from behind, I realise it's not the Amicus I know. Instead he's in full robes and he's a lot more skinny than I remember. I slow down, wondering why he's not looking at me with all the splashing noises I'm making. As I'm about to call up to him though, I see brown arms wrap around him, smoothing over his arms and back, and that's when Amicus turns to the side. I see now that those arms belong to another wolf, smaller and brown furred, one they've never seen before. Amicus is doing the same to him, paws moving around his body in a way that's awkward and hesitant, a pair of young lovers making out for the first time. I watch, suddenly feeling embarrassed. I'm back in Amicus's room, and that same teenaged wolf is now on the sofa, bent over, hiding his face behind his paws. I've never seen Amicus really cry, but I can tell that's what he's doing now. I feel a sense of complete and utter shame, the feeling that you've let everyone down. It consumes me. I reach out toward the young wolf, wanting to comfort him, wondering if I even know who I am. Suddenly I'm sucked back into the cosmos. There's no parent this time. Instead, I float peacefully through the vacuum, staring down at what I assume is a Dastra. Even though there isn't anyone here with me, I sense beings all around me. I also get a sense of approval, like their work is done. Finish Mira's work, young human. Just like that, I start to drift back down toward the moon, descending faster and faster until everything becomes a blur. This time, coming too feels real, and immediately know I'm not in a dream. I smell lavender. Amicus? My eyes feel like they're glued shut, and I have to rub at them to get them to fully open. The first thing I see is the sky. The planet Anchoris and the moon talk, both of them glowing brightly. I stare at the two floating orbs for a while, waiting for things to fall into place as to why I'm out here. I'm laying on something hard, like concrete, and I feel soft but weighty things on my chest. My hands are curled around it, and I lift it slowly to have a look, even though it feels like a fifty-pound dumbbell. Flowers. With a fair bit of lavender mixed in. Slowly I turn my head, and again I get the feeling of heavy weights attached to my body. I somehow manage it, and immediately see that I'm in the amphitheatre. At the same time I see more flowers and I realise they are arranged all around me in a circle. Moving my head around also makes me realise there's something scratchy and prickly on my head. Still struggling with my heavy hand I reach up and grab at it. I lift it from my head and hold it in front of my face, my eyes taking a few moments to focus to find out it's a wreath, pink flowers woven into the twigs. I finally drop my arm to the side, getting too tired to hold it up and I watch it lazily roll a few feet away. The movement sends a wave of tingling through my body but it fades quickly. The heavy weakness is also starting to fade. I'm more worried about how I got here, why I'm covered in flowers. From what I can tell I'm in the gardens, though a part of it I haven't been to before. I close my eyes, trying to remember how I got here. Amicus, the trial of rhetoric, the restaurant, being sick. Again I lift my arm, though it's easier this time when I look at the skin. It's covered in crusty yellowish scabs, though they don't hurt. I don't know why, but I get the feeling that the skin underneath is completely healed. I try to think again. I do remember throwing up on Cassius, but after that, just terrible dreams. Did they heal me somehow? Is this flower thing part of that? 
and feeling some of my strength returning, so I forced myself into a sitting position, joints popping and muscles stiff. Still, with every movement, things get easier. I do get light-headed, though, and I have to sit there for a moment, looking around again, wondering where Amicus is. It sounded so desperate and sad the last time I heard him. I need to show him I'm okay now. At least I think I am. I slowly push myself up, listening to the gunshot cracks of my knees as if I hadn't used them for days. I stand unsteady in the centre of the square, looking around at the circle of flowers. I'm startled when I turn and see a wolf behind me. Well, it's just a sculpture. A male wolf decked out in armour, both of his paws raised to the sky. He's got a bunch of flowers weaved around his wrists and on his head too. I wait for a few moments, listening for anyone that might be nearby. All I hear are the insects around me. So I start to move toward the path I know leads to the palace. Though I'm pretty sure I'm not dreaming now, this eerie scenario has me questioning that. This whole situation is surreal. All of the things that I remember happening last feel so distant. Despite spending all of my time on the Dastra trying to be covert, I find myself longing to find someone, anyone really. I just need to know what's happened. And pretty soon I do find someone. His back is to me, stooped over, fur almost ghostly in the glow of the garden lights. The cat busies himself with some flowers, a pair of metal clippers in his paws. As I get closer, I can hear him humming just above the noise of his busy snipping. I'm just opening my mouth when I see his ears perk. Cass, you know I don't like these games. Alex turns to face me, a knowing smile on his lips. That quickly disappears the second he sees me, though, replaced by a look of complete shock. Ah! Whatever he was trying to say doesn't seem to want to come out, and instead he just stands there gaping at me. Hey, hey! I can barely talk, my voice rasping out like sandpaper on wood. I take a step forward and that's when Alex finally reacts, jumping almost a foot into the air in a backwards motion, putting space between us as he yelps. What? What? How? He stutters and stumbles over his words. I've seen Alex flustered before, but never like this. There's real fear in his eyes as he stumbles against some bushes. I wonder if he's just going to take off running, but instead he stands there quivering as he holds the clippers up in front of his chest, as if contemplating using them as a weapon. I raise my hands reassuringly. Hey, Alex, it's me. I cough a few times, trying to clear my throat. I see Alex's ears twitch at the sound as he slowly lowers the clippers, though he moves the side away from the bush, giving himself a clear path to the palace. Keyboard? How? He's staring at me like what he's seen is impossible. How what? I'm regaining my voice slowly but surely. What's happening? Alex finally seems to get a hold of himself, first slowly laying flat against the eyes me, looking almost suspicious. I could ask you the same thing. This catches me off guard. Why? Well... Alex looks around for focusing on me again, tilting his head as if to look at me from a different angle. You were... well, you were dead. Dead? Well, not completely, but you were in a coma that we were told you would not wake up from. Oh. I look down at myself as to confirm that I am indeed alive and well. Aside from the patchy scabs all over my arms and legs, I feel okay, aside from the grogginess. I thought the doctor healed me. Alex sees he is perk. Doctor? I mean, I think there was a doctor. I heard him when I was brought back here. Alex's eyes narrow. Amicus told you a vegetative before he arrived. How did you hear him? I I don't know. Um, I might have dreamed it. I was really out of it. If you were still conscious when he arrived, he should have been able to halt the damage caused by the virus. Who was the doctor? With every passing second, I regain more and more of my wits, and Alex's demeanour is confusing me. He thought I was dead, and instead of being happy, I feel like he's interrogating me. That's also when I realise something else. Wait, you all think I'm dead? Well, not me anymore, obviously. It's all very strange. How did you survive, exactly? Now the cat is starting to annoy me, and I look past him toward the palace, the situation finally dawning on me. Where's Amicus? 
The cat is quiet for a moment as if contemplating something, then quirks his head. Well, I'm not sure. He's been here and there, though I haven't seen him for at least a day. I walk past the cat toward the palace, realising what sort of state the wolf might be in. Why are you going? Well, I'm very happy to see that you're well. This is all just very sudden and unexpected. I ignore Alex, not really in the mood to figure out why he's acting the way he is. He's making me feel like I'm still dreaming. So I walk quickly and I'm relieved that he doesn't follow me. The wave of cool air that hits me as I enter the palace is a welcome feeling and I find myself grateful to be back. Despite having apparently been here the whole time, it really does feel like I've been away for weeks. I pick up the pace as I head towards Amicus's room, practically jogging. I have to let him know that I'm okay. The short distance to his room seems like it takes longer than it ever has before. I'm glad I don't run into anyone else on the way. That interaction with Alex was weird. I don't need a repeat of that right now. I finally make it to his door and immediately hear muffled chattering behind it. I don't hesitate though and I press my hand to the panel. The door slides open. Instead of the usual blast of even colder air I'd often get from Amicus's room, it's stuffy warm and the smell a little bit musky. The lights are dimmed and my heart sinks when I see the empty bed. I linger in the doorway though, something feeling off. The droning chatter is calm, giving what sounds like a monologue on the history of some past emperor. I see wine bottles too, mostly bunched together on top of the bedside table. There are also a few laying here and there on the tip floor. Amicus? I call out, starting to become afraid of what I might find. I take a few tentative steps into the room, then I hear a loud snore, and instantly the worrying grip in my chest starts to release. I'd recognise that sound anywhere. I hurry over to the other side of the bed, where I find my wolf splayed out on the floor, a wine bottle next to his head, only in his underwear. He's clearly asleep, or passed out, muzzle hanging wide open as another thunderous snore shakes the floor. Amicus! I crouch down next to him, resting a hand on his chest, trying to shake him awake. His only response is a few more broken snorts for drooling out the side of his muzzle. I switch to patting at his face, then grabbing his muzzle and shaking it around, noticing how crusty the fur is, something I never felt on Amicus before. Amicus! I consider slapping him like I've seen people do in the movies, and I see the bottle next to his head and decide to go for another approach. I snatch it up and hurry to the bathroom. I hold the bottle under the faucet for a good five seconds, letting it fill up with soapy water to the halfway point where I hurry back out into the room. Meanwhile, Com doesn't seem to notice me, droning on about how this particular emperor was known to have a fondness of orchids. I crouch down next to Amicus again, hesitating for a second as I wonder if maybe I should call Cato. Well, probably not Cato. Neferu, maybe? Just in case Amicus is actually in trouble. I don't know how much a wolf can drink for it can kill them, but the sheer amount of bottles laying around the room worries me. I decide to just go ahead with my plan, and I append the bottle over Amicus's face. It pours directly onto his nose and he immediately chokes, turning his head this way and that to avoid the stream of bubbly water. I have a moment to wonder if drowning him is the best approach, for he suddenly sits up, pouring into his face. Ah! The wolf covers his eyes. It's only then they realise how irritating the soap might be for them. Oh shit, sorry. Should I get some water from the shower so you can rinse your eyes out? Amicus freezes, still covering his face, then slowly lowers his paws to reveal his bleary, bloodshot eyes. He stares at me in a way that he never has before. It's kind of surprised like Alex had been, but rather than fear, Amicus simply looks empty. Numb. Are you okay? I reach out, but Amicus turns his head away. Away oh, with you, ghost. Enough of your torment. He keeps his head turned away, eyes closed. Ghost? Amicus, it's me. I reach out and grab his face and that seems to shock him as he jumps and turns to look me right in the eye. I can tell he's drunk, very drunk. There's an extra distant look in his eyes that I don't like. Amicus, what do you want? Did you take something? I hold his big head steady, feeling the fullness of his cheeks in my hands, looking into his familiar eyes, no matter how glazed and focused they are. Then I find myself throwing my arms around his neck and leaning into his body, the reality of the situation crashing down on me all at once. 
Amicus gasps into my ears if my touch suddenly makes him realise that I'm real, that I'm here. Clumsily, he starts to stand up, pulling me with him. It's difficult because I don't let go, almost getting lifted off my feet for I settle on letting go for just a moment, hug him lower, around his body, pressing my head to his chest, hearing his heart hammering inside. Finally, he's able to get a grip on me and push me away, despite my intention to cling to him forever. He holds me at arm's length, staring at me. I clutch his paws on my shoulders, staring up at him, feeling my eyes start to water. Is, is this possible? Is, oh no, please. I can't handle another hallucination. His expression keeps morphing from hope and awe to devastation. I feel his paws grip into my shoulders tightly, almost painfully, as if to make sure I'm real. It's me. I woke up in the garden for some reason. I'm okay. I want to hug him again, but he keeps holding me away, looking me up and down, pushing my hair back and feeding my crusty skin. But... but how? I don't know. I just remember having crazy dreams. Then I was in the garden. As I'm talking, I think Amicus is finally believing it's me. I notice his body is starting to sway in a worrying manner. Amicus? I reach out to steady him, but as I do, his eyes roll back and I realise there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to keep a wolf over twice my weight from toppling over. I try anyway, wrapping my arms around him as Amicus falls backwards, his bulk pulling me down with him for he falls back first onto the bedside table, sending bottles flying while his upper back and head smashes into the wall. My fore is absorbed by his much softer front. The sound is loud. The room's shaking and probably waking up the entire palace. Waking the wolf up the second time is a lot easier, probably because he'd fainted rather than passed out from too much wine. Released really able to move onto the bed where Amicus sits cross-legged, pulling me onto his lap and just holding me there, his paws moving around my body, still trying to make sure I'm real. For a moment we don't talk, the wolf just pressing his nose to my hair and breathing in deeply. I feel a little self-conscious, knowing I must not smell very good right now. That doesn't seem to bother Amicus as he goes on pressing his nose to my head and neck, taking in my scent. Finally, he does speak, but it's one word. How? I turn my head toward the wolf, resting my cheek against his neck. I don't know. I don't really even know what happened to me. Oh, you got sick. So sick. You were having convulsions, brain and nerve damage. It was... it was terrible. Amicus's arms tightened around me, his voice normally deep and strong, now sounding weak and broken. This statement worries me, though, and I have to wonder if I really am better. There seem to be patches missing from my memory, and I do feel different, like I'm not fully myself. I don't really want to think about it right now. I think I remember a little bit of that. I had... I lift my arm up, showing Amicus the shiny, crusty scabs on my arm. It was aviopox. I, I can't believe I didn't consider the possibility of disease and Ill illness for you. Oh, I'm just so used to the idea of any new arrival and a dastra going through that process. Obviously, we did it a bit differently. Yeah. Honestly, I'm not even sure I'd have you do it. I don't know if you'd react differently to those vaccinations. Each species has their own customised cocktail. Maybe a pox isn't included in the vaccination set. It's such a mild virus, we've never seen anyone react to the way you did, even other primates. I think back to how quickly I became sick, how quickly I almost died. I notice Amicus is looking down at me again and look back up at him. What? Amicus shakes his head. Oh, I'm just still trying to make sure you're here, that you're real. I, I'm afraid if I let go, if I even look away, you'll, you'll disappear. His arms tighten around me again, squeezing a huff of breath out of me. I'm here, I promise. Well, I've had a lot of hallucinations and too many stress tablets, I think. Stress tablets? Yes, uh, quite a few of them, in fact. With wine? Oh, yes. Amicus! 
I don't really know what these stress tablets are, but I imagine mixing space Xanax with alcohol is a horrible idea. Amicus doesn't seem bothered by my reprimand, though, instead just snuggling closer to me, his crusted face for a prickly against my skin. I love you, Tibor. I get that familiar swooping feeling in my chest like I'm on a roller coaster. I clutch onto his arms. I love you too. Amicus sighs and sets his chin on my head. Oh, I thought I missed the opportunity to say it. I, I still can't believe you're real. Well, I am, I promise. But I still don't understand how. This shouldn't be possible. You were declared to be in a permanent coma. No brain activity. I had to set you out in the garden and only hope for a miracle. Miracle? Amicus lets out a shaky sigh, running his fingers through my hair. When a sapient falls into such a state, we simply let them fade away in a peaceful setting, or possibly recover if the parent allows it. I sat out there for a while, but couldn't bear to see you waste away, so I came back to my room to drink and prepare for the Emperorship. I imagine Amicus laying those flowers around me and I feel my heart break a little. Did did the parents come to you? Is that why you're here? Well, I had hoped they would. I shrug. I really can't remember much. Oh, it does not matter. Oh, my prayers were answered. Praise the gods. Amicus starts to smother me again with his hugging. The little bits of imagery from my dreams are starting to come back to me. Something that happened in space. Someone talking to me. Oh, and judging by the only human I know, your people are full of surprises. But we can figure it out later. I just want to hold you right now. Okay. And Tibor? Yeah? Uh, please try to avoid mentioning that I uh, lost consciousness when I saw you. Of course. So we sit there for a while longer while Amicus just sort of cuddles with me. After about an hour, we finally decide to move the shower, considering the state we're both in. We shower together, taking turns scrubbing each other. The hot water really brings life back into my limbs, and those worrying tingles have faded to the point where I'm barely noticing them now. Amicus gently rubs at my crusted skin, and we're both surprised to see it come away, exposing new unblemished skin underneath. Incredible. Well, I never knew humans healed at such a rate. Yeah. I don't know if that's really the case. My mind continues to wander back to those vague, hard to remember dreams I was having. Meanwhile, Amicus leans back against the walls I rub soap into his front, smiling gently as I lather up his chest. I can tell he's still fairly drunk, but that doesn't stop his cock from becoming fully erect between us, which I just pretend not to notice. His eyes widen if he suddenly realises something. Wait, did anyone else notice you? I pause, both my hands kept in his sizable pecs. Yeah, actually, Alex was in the garden, I talked to him. Well, just Alex. Yeah. Amicus seems to relax a bit. Well, what did he say? Just seemed really surprised. Oh, unsurprising. But he was acting a little weird. Amicus shrugs. Well, he keeps things to himself for the most part. I'd be worried if you ran into Cato or Cassius especially. I need to think of a way to explain this to them. This simian guy is becoming harder to keep up. I'm about to mention more about Alex's demeanour. That's when Amicus just starts hugging me again. His dick hot and firm crushing between us as he does. I don't care though, and Amicus doesn't seem to either. Well, I don't understand any of this right now. But as long as it's real, I don't care. It feels so good like this. His wet fur is slicked down tightly to his thick body, which pres presses against me perfectly. Amicus finally shuts off the water from a blast with hot air. I am dried in less than a minute, and I stumble out to try and fix my poofy hair in the mirror, while Amicus stands in the shower stall for a while longer. After another few minutes, I watch him step out and come up behind me to nuzzle my ears, embracing me once again. He really can't keep his paws off me, but I completely understand why. He starts nudging me out to the be into the bedroom before turning me around to face him, lowering his face to mine, and I finally realise where this is going. 
It feels so sudden, especially after everything that's happened. I think we could use more time to adjust. But I kiss back anyway. We've kissed a few times before, but only with our lips. Now his tongue presses against my mouth, I only hesitate for a moment for letting it in, his thinner, longer tongue caressing mine with a surprising nimble strength. I thought it'd be kind of hard to make out with the way his muzzle is shaped, but Amicus makes it happen, his lips clamping around my mouth as he kisses deeper. I'm amazed at how bold he's been, I wonder if it's maybe because he's still pretty inebriated. He cradles my head gently, walking me backwards slowly. His cock po- poking against my groin and thighs occasionally till I come against the bed. Gently he lowers me down to rest on my back. Both paws come into press on either side of my shoulders while he looms over me, grinning before he pauses. Well, is this okay? I think. I mean, are you okay? We can wait until tomorrow when you're less uh, drunk. He grins again. Oh, I've been wanting to do this for so long. Show you how much I love you. Amicus leans down, nuzzling my neck. Oh, I thought I'd missed that chance. I can't tell you how dark these past three days have been for me. I I ran out of tears yesterday. Amicus looks away for a moment. Oh, I'm not going to miss that chance now. I reach up and hold his head steady again for I lean up to kiss him. This may be alcohol fueled. it may be sudden, but after everything that's happened, after what Amicus has been through, I want us to be able to do this before anything else happens. He huffs loudly through his nose, the burst of hot air tickling my face as he falls to the bed, roaring to the side to pull me up on top of him. His massive soft body cushions me like it always does, rising and falling with his quickening breaths. His kissing becoming more and more aggressive as he lets out little growls and snarls. All the reservations I had about having sex with an alien wolf fall away at that moment. After everything that's happened, and especially after almost dying, I just don't care anymore. We grind against each other, both of us hard now as we just explore the other's body. His giant paws sliding up and down my side so I do the same to him. Eventually I sit up, straddling his waist, looking down at him, just sort of taking him in. Again he has that silly grin on his face, his paws on my thighs, kneading at the skin and muscle. Oh, you're beautiful. That makes me laugh. Beautiful? Well, you're adorable. Amicus raises an eyebrow. Oh, I'm not sure that's a correct descriptor of the next emperor of Adastra. Ah, ah. I lean forward and aggressively rub at his belly, his weak spot, immediately neutralising his snark as his paws flop back against his head, eyes almost rolling with pleasure for he squeezes them shut. He rises and arches around my hands, leaning to the rub as I slide my hands up to his chest and all the way down to his lower stomach. When that happens, I feel his dick jump against my rear, making me realise how hard I'm getting him. I'm getting the same way as I make the strong, thick body below me undulate with pleasure. His head rolls from side to side, tongue flopping back and forth. When I giggle at him, that seems to finally bring him out of his trance. He growls and grips my arms. That is cheating. With that, he rolls me over, easily reversing our positions as he mounts me, pinning my hair hands against above my head with one paw. With his other, he tries to rub up my stomach, which makes me laugh and squirm when he finally lets off. That, that doesn't work, our primates. Oh, it seemed like it worked well to me. He lets go of my hands and leans down to nuzzle at my face, his cold nose exploring my chin, cheeks and forehead. He then starts to adjust his position before he suddenly stops, looking up at me. Um, his he is lower and I can tell he's embarrassed. What? Do you humans, uh, for males, do you go through the uh, the rear? Oh, I think about that. That would be the expected route, but looking at Amicus's length, the wolf follows my gaze and looks even more embarrassed. Oh, I don't have to. I don't want to hurt you, of course. I prop myself up on my elbows, looking between the two of us. Yeah, maybe some other time. You're kind of thick. Amicus smirks. Thank you. He starts adjusting himself again, squatting as he sort of waddles up the so our dicks are parallel to each other. Or maybe, uh, maybe this? 
He slowly lowers himself until we make contact. The feel inside of his electric, the hot flesh of his pressing against mine firmly. Out of sight, I feel his furry balls come to rest gently on top of mine, the soft forms moulding together easily. Amicus pauses there, smiling down at me gently as he rests both paws to either side of my head. You'll have to excuse my ignorance. I'm not sure how humans might copulate. He wiggles his hips, causing his length to slide from side to side on top of mine after to stifle a gasp. I, I think it's about the same uh, from what I saw. Amicus frowns for a moment as he realises what exactly it is I'm referencing, but quickly recovers as he leans down to kiss me once again. Once he's finished, I smile back up at him. But yeah, this is fine. I rest my hands on his knees, noting how he's balancing most of his considerable weight in his squat. Are you comfortable, though? That looks like a workout. Huh. Cato works me a lot harder than this, Tebow. Amicus frowns again as he realises how that could be interpreted. I mean, he makes me do a lot of squatting exercises. Oh, I'll just consider this extra practice. I reach out and feel up the wolf's chest and belly while he speaks, again marvelling at how powerful it all is. Amicus chuckles and arches out a bit to give me a better feel, taking deep breaths and puffing out his chest. He shudders as I rub at his nipples, the nerves of flesh hardening instantly. Hmm, so now that you're comfortable... Tentatively, Amicus reaches down with his left paw and carefully lifts my length from my stomach to press against his. This time I let out a little gasp, being squeezed together like this, sending a jolt of pleasure up from my dick through my body and into my brain. Immediately my skin breaks out into goosebumps that shiver to Amicus's touch, his gentle but all enveloping paw feeling so good right now. He starts off slowly at first, beginning to jerk us both off in small, quick motions. I can tell he's been overly careful with me, so I jerk my hips up against him, encouraging more. He seems to get the hint and he picks up speed, giving the two of us deeper, faster strokes that makes me grip at the bedsheets on either side of me, staring at the ceiling as I let out soft pants and groans. Amicus gets more and more into it, already leaking all over my own dick as he pumps his paw, bicep bulging with the effort. I've been jerked off by others before, but Amicus's paw really is something else. Of course, it's big, but the soft, squishy pads on his palm and fingers add to the pleasure, giving me a texture I've never felt before. The wolf starts to thrust his powerful hips into the stroking, making the bed squeak and shake. Again, his strength is evident in how he practically moves my entire body with each thrust, the idea that he's holding back turning me on even more. I feel his heavy sack bouncing on top of mine. My knees jerk up with each thrust, and each time they do, I feel his large rear end slam up against them, its furry form tight and clenched. Oh, I'm getting close. He pants out over my head, a drop of drool dripping down onto my cheek. I start to thrust up against him in earnest, wanting to match his climax. At this point, we're almost bouncing on the bed with how hard the wolf is thumping against me, forgetting his strength in the moment. I don't mind, though, not really caring how sore I'm going to be tomorrow as the pleasure overtakes me. It hits me all at once and I reach out to put a hand against his face, letting him know and he takes out his signal to let go as well. I feel it in his entire body, the wolf tensing up, muscles tightening, standing out through the fur on his thigh, stomach and chest. I see his face as he balances on the edge of climax, eyes wide and looking toward the ceiling, mouth hanging open, a look of pure awe. I feel it in his cock too, and at the same time we're both pushed over the edge. I groan, something I don't usually do, but the build-up, the situation, the feeling is all too much. It's drowned out by the sound that Amicus makes though. He practically sags over me, letting out a bassy, rumbling moan of ecstasy. Hearing the masculine deep voice making a sound of such pleasure spurs on another spasm from my cock. I think the same happens to Amicus, as he suddenly hunches forward again, muzzle right next to my ear as he groans out again, his hot rush of breath on the side of my face making me shudder. The big wolf continues to thrust against me in time with the spurts from his cock, look on his face now one of goofy pleasure, his long tongue drooping out, dripping onto my chest. His climax goes on for several seconds longer than mine, 
and I watch as he spurts over my stomach over and over till he finally collapses down against me, his fur damp with sweat. I wrap my arms around him as he heaves for breath, feeling his body expand and contract against mine. He nestles against my head, his stomach flattened against mine, against the mess we've made. We're going to have to take another shower. Even though I'm a bit out of breath, I'm kind of amused at how much Amicus is gasping, sounding like he just ran a marathon. It really put everything into that. Uh, 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 you, you. I hold his head against mine, turning to kiss him on the cheek. Me. You. You. Uh, incredible. Oh, thanks. You're really something too. Uh, a good something? A very good something. We lay there quietly for a moment. Amicus propping himself up a bit on his knees and elbows so his entire weight doesn't rest on top of me. How are your legs? Huh, burning. Well, probably the most intense exercise my thighs have ever been through, huh, but it was worth it. Again we lay there quietly as Amicus just sort of strokes my hair. Oh, I'm still terrified that this is a dream. I came more tightly to my body, almost forced him to fall on top of me. I'm here, and I'll be here in the morning when you wake up. Oh, you're better, otherwise I'll never forgive you. His speech slurs a bit as he whispers into my ear. I look at him. So, exactly how drunk are you? The wolf shrugs, slowly rolling off of me, cold air hitting the fluids on my stomach. Oh, I'm fairly sober now. Uh, shall we wash up? He reaches out a paw and I take it, slightly surprised as he pulls me up to be carried in his arms like I'm his new bride. We go to the shower and wash up again, even more slowly than we did the first time. When we come back to the bed, Amicus continues to dote over me, hardly ever letting me go at any point. I can tell he's legitimately worried this isn't real and I feel the same way. After everything that's happened, this doesn't seem possible. Eventually I lay in the bed next to him and he spoons me tightly against his body. He's extremely warm, but with no blankets and the cold air drifting down on top of us, it's perfect. Pretty soon I'm drifting off to sleep, listening to the wolf's soft snores in my ear. Thankfully, I don't dream. Get up! I jump at the same time I feel Amicus jolt against me. We both struggle to sit up while pulling the covers up around us. Get out of the bed! The jar and appearance of Cato has me staring at him in surprise, unsure of what to do. Amicus immediately moves, so pulling me off the bed with him, standing slightly in front of me as he hands me the blanket to cover myself up. We both stare at Cato, the old wolf actually shaking with fury. Make yourself decent, Amicus! Amicus hurriedly snatches up underwear from the dresser, giving me one of my own as well. As I'm struggling to tie mine on, I notice Cassius standing in the doorway, something shining and flashing with lights in his paw. He doesn't have the usual sour look on his face, though. Instead, he almost looks scared. Cato lets us stand in silence for a moment before turning his head toward the door. Felix, enter! I hear shuffling around in the, out in the hallway and Cassius moves to the side to allow a neatly robed wolf to enter. He looks about as old as Cato, though nowhere near as big. He moves timidly, looking about with his ears down. Yes, your imperial majesty. Is that the alien you treated for avian pox? Cato jerks his head at me, keeping his eyes on Felix. Felix turns to look at me and I can tell he's trying to think of the right thing to say. Finally he just gulps and nods his head. Yes, I treated him three nights ago for avian pox. And his species had no profile? No, I can only tell he's a primate. How, how is he conscious? Come, escort Felix to the dungeons. Yes, Cato. What? Why, why to the dungeons, your majesty? Felix looks imploringly at Cato for the probe's enter. Proceed to the hall or risk being shot, Felix. Please, what is happening? Even while he speaks, Felix backs away out of the room, Cato completely ignoring him. We all listen to the doctor's stumbling steps out in the Equin Hall, the wolf making an attempt to ask Cassius what's happening before things fall silent again. Ca Cassius, come in and close the door! Cassius, looking even more scared now, steps inside and allows the door to close. Cato stares at the two of us. 
this point, Namika says one paw on my arm, keeping me firmly halfway behind his back. I'm still able to look around his shoulder at the furious acting emperor. Slowly I'm starting to realise what might be happening right now, and Cato's next words confirm it. Amicus, did you make first contact? Amicus is silent for a beat, but responds in a strong, confident voice. No, of course not. What in the world are you talking about, Cato? Cato stares, jaw clenched, then screams at the volume I didn't think he was capable of. Do not play games with me, Amicus! To his credit, Amicus only jumps a little bit, his grip still firmly on my arm. The silence that follows rings in my ears as Cato seems to work to calm himself down. When he speaks again, his voice is barely above a whisper. He is unprofiled. All children abandoned or not are profiled. He is not a simian, so what is he? Amicus is frozen. I feel my stomach drop like I'm going to piss myself. I see Cato work in his jaw. And is it true he's your lover? Lover? How would he know anything about that? Amicus doesn't answer this time, and that seems to be enough for Cato. Fine, do not answer. We will take the correct precautions. Come! Yes, Cato. Terminate Tibor! No! Amicus simultaneously throws himself in front of me while reaching back and hugging to me, him, hugging me to him with both paws backing me against the wall. Drones begin to enter the bedroom, but Cato barks out another order. Pause last directive! Pause in last directive. My view is obscured now where I can hear Amicus's heavy breathing, his heart hammering so hard I can feel it through his back. Once again, Cato allows the silence to stretch out before speaking. Then tell us the truth, Amicus! You must not harm him, otherwise I will give you nothing, and I'll have you thrown in the dungeon when I become emperor. More silence. I wince, wondering how that could possibly be the right thing to say. Then I hear a low, low growling sound, what I'm sure is coming from Cato. How dare you! You think you'll become emperor after this? In fact... I hear a quick movement, and the next thing I know, Amicus is wrenched from in front of me. I watch he slides across the floor before Cato pounces on him, pinning him there. Cassius, grab the alien! Set the Nervo to lethal! No, please! I'm frozen, but I manage to look up at Cassius, who seems just as frozen as I am, holding the nerve on his trembling paws. Move, you idiot! Cassius jumps and hurries over to me. I start to pull away, but he grabs me up in an awkward hole, setting the nerve against my neck. No! Amicus' struggles double, and Cato is bucked around like he's on a mechanical bull. Cease struggling, Amicus! He will not be harmed if you do as I say! Amicus seems to calm down a bit at that, panting wetly against the floor as he looks straight at me, face full of desperation. You've proven yourself being an incompetent fool, even more so than I originally thought. You've endangered our entire empire. For this you will not become emperor. Rules be damned. It's a wonder how you thought you'd get away with this. It can only be a miracle the monster not found out, and they surely would if you became emperor with that thing. Cato stands and wrenches Amicus to his feet, twisting near the wolf's paws behind his back, hard enough the Amicus lets out a bark of pain. The third trial begins today. You will lose and Cassius will become emperor. Cato begins to push Amicus to the doorway. Do as I say and I will let the alien live. Otherwise we can all do all of this in the most unpleasant way possible. Understand? Amicus is quiet and Cato shakes him by his pinned arms. Ah, Yes! Good, now to the amphitheatre. We will do this quickly. Do not make any stupid moves, otherwise I will let the drones escort you instead. Cato presses Amicus toward the door. I see Amicus glance back at me, the look on his face one of utter helplessness. They're out the door by the time Cassius realises he's supposed to be following. He jumps for awkwardly, pushing me after them. It's already sunset when we get to the amphitheatre. We must have slept for most of the day. Amicus and Cato are already standing in the centre of the amphitheatre as Cassius struggles to move me down the steps. Sit him down, Cassius, and get down here! Shakily, Cassius plants me down one of the stone steps for suddenly undress him. That's when I notice he's tucked the nerve into his waistband. Possibly because of the frantic nature of the whole situation, Cassius seems to have forgotten it and I watch it fall into his clothing as he drops it from his waist. He then stumbles his way down to the centre. Amicus, meanwhile, stands stiffly next to Cato, his paws clenched. I feel my heart sink as I see the look on his face. 
gets no idea what to do. Several camera drones have followed us to the amphitheatre, the lights glowing in ominous red. Several moments, Cater watches them arrange themselves around the small theatre, their lenses flashing into the fading light. Cato? What, Cassius? There was no trial scheduled for today. How will this be broadcast anyway? This will not be live. I will think of a reason to tell the people later. We only need a single clip of you being victorious. They will never believe this. Though Amicus is put on a brave face, I can hear his voice shaking. Pugnu is a combination of skill and luck. It's not always the strongest that wins. We will manage. And how? Cato suddenly whirls on Amicus, throwing a punch so hard into his jaw, the other wolf spins on with 360 degrees while collapsing on the hard floor of the amphitheatre. I'm standing up without even remembering to do so, heart hammering my throat as I look down at Amicus. It doesn't move. Meanwhile, Cato shakes his paw lightly, like only stung a little bit. Cassius, on the other hand, is clasping both his ears and his paws, staring down at his brother in a mix of shock and horror. Cato, what are you doing? Making it look more authentic, it's all. Amicus stirs on the ground then, groaning and pushing himself up. I see dark spots forming under his face, blood dripping from his nose. A camera drone drifts slowly, filming Amicus as he spits out blood. I realise then I have to do something. I've been told to sit on the sidelines for far too long. I'm not entirely convinced I'm going to be okay after this. I'm a risk to the entire empire. Why would Cato let me live after I'm done being useful? I have to do something. So I quietly sit back down and I lean over to reach into Cassidy's pile of clothes, quickly finding the nerve on pulling it out. Then I stand back up again to take a step downward and no one seems to notice. Come on, Amicus, get up! You need to grapple with Cass! Why didn't we just use makeup instead? There is no time! Cato finally bends down to grab Amicus into the arms and heave him up to his feet. The big wolf left to stumble unsteadily, blood running down his chin. Cassius, get Amicus in an ankle lock and drop him. That should be enough. They set up their scene, even though Amicus seems almost completely out of it. All of them are distracting, and I this might be my only chance. Slowly, I take one step at a time down toward the centre of the amphitheatre. Meanwhile, Cassius is struggling to pick up Amicus's leg, almost losing his own balance as he does. After that, Cato tells Amicus to fall back, which the wolf does, slowly. Cassius pins him on the ground after that, and I don't think it looks convincing at all. That doesn't really matter now, as I'm only a few steps from the ground floor. Now, stand and raise your paws in victory, Cass. Look proud. At this moment, things start to move in slow motion. Amicus is flat on his back, but he's looking right at me. There's a question look in his eyes, and a pleading one is urging me to step back. I don't. Instead, I take the final step down to the floor of the amphitheatre just behind Cassius. The white wolf continues to celebrate his pretend victory, turning with raised paws right into the nerve that I stab into his chest. Instantly, Cass is shot backwards several feet to crumple next to Amicus, shivering and convulsing. Before I can even turn to Cato, though, the old wolf is on me, grabbing the nerve out of my hands and pulling me close by the front of my robes, my teeth clacking together with how fast he does it. He's looking at the nerve rather than me, though. Damn it! Thank God the idiot didn't have it set on lethal! Cato fiddles with the device and I realize he's about to use it on me. I struggle, kicking at the massive wolf, but he's stronger, stronger than even Amicus. Just as he flips the device around, the two metal prongs pointed at my face, I see a paw come over the top of Cato's head. Amicus grips into the metal grating of Cato's face mask, fingers locking into the gaps before he pulls. Cato screams, and I hear a horrible mix of crunching, tearing, and an electronic hiss as he red spurt from the old wolf's face for just a moment before he goes down. Amicus stares at me with wild eyes as he tries to keep Cato pinned. Tibor, run! Run to Neferu! Run! I stare at Amicus numbly for a moment, a moment in which I want to do so much, but can't then turn and start to run. I run as fast as I can, disappearing behind the trees and bushes, just as I hear Cato yelling for Com to execute me. That's what you call a cliffhanger. That's really something. If you listen, you, did you think uh, Cato sounds a bit different? That's kind of my deliberate reaction. Uh, if uh, any of you know Michael Wisher, who was, who was and actually passed away many years ago, sadly, uh, I'm ba- trying to base Cato's voice on him because I think about Cato now as I think about one of his more famous characters. 
I can't do the voice, unfortunately, but uh, he has lines like, Yes, just the pressure of my, vial, my thumb against the vial that would end all life. Such power would put me above the gods, and with the Daleks I shall have that power! <clears throat> yeah, he does it much better. I'm deliberately trying to now base Cato on Davros. Because, let's face it, Davros created the Daleks, and that's one of the worst things anyone's ever done in the whole universe. <laughs> and right now, I don't want Cato to die, actually. I want him suffering. I think Amicus is doing the right thing. Let's have Cato locked up in the dungeons. Hurting. Yes. I th also, I think I know what's been going on in the past. I'm not going to uh, say too much, because this is my guesswork, but... I think I know why he's so scared of the monitors. Because I think I might know what happened to Amicus's father. Yes, he is dead, but... Was it an accident? Or was it someone wanting to get rid of him? I'm saying that we're going to have to wait at least a month. Well, you are. I've got, I'm a patron. I get to hear this sooner. But I'll have to wait another month or so with this uh, next update, which I will be doing as soon as I can. Can't wait to find out what happens there. As long as Howley uh, does something nasty to Cato at some point at the end of the end, I'm going to be happy with that. Preferably have him uh, tried and found guilty of killing someone in front of the whole Red Astra. That would work. Yeah, that's... Anyway, that's enough talk about this. I noticed the uh, viewing figures last time. As soon as I start talking about stuff generally, most of you have turned off. So those of you who are still here, thanks for listening to me ramble on for a bit. And don't forget, to, if, you're a pat if you haven't become a patron yet, you should check out Howley's Patron. Echo, Smoke Room, Dastry you can help all of those as little as $3 a month. And also perhaps as a patron, and uh, you can check out some of Blackson's work as well. Check all these people out. They're amazing work here. And you always check my work out, obviously, but I'm nowhere there. Level. <laughs> Until next time, and silly voices aside, have a good day. <laughs>